Senator, thanks so much for being with us. Thank you. Uh, let me just start by asking, what is it like being at the center of the political universe? Everybody wants to know what you're going to do, what you're thinking, a lot of pressure. How does it feel? Well, um, the most important thing to me is to focus on uh, the issue itself and whether or not it's the right policy, how best to improve it, getting more facts, talking to my staff, talking to others, talking to people in Maine um, and others who are involved in, in the healthcare field. And so it's always about eliciting the very best information to craft the very best policy. That generally is what govern has governed me throughout my years of service in, in Congress, as well as uh, when I first started in the state legislature in Maine. How much are you hearing from the President, from Rahm Emanuel, from all of the uh, uh, people at the White House? Well, I have, I've talked to the President on a number of occasions, uh, and I think the most... You talk to them every day now? No, not every day. People do you know, make that point, but no, I don't. Uh, I've, you know, I talked to him last Friday. Uh, it was the last conversation I had several times. All about issues. You know, I've met with him on uh, several occasions and had um, you know numerous phone conversations about the issues and how to affect the best policy, uh, what are his positions and his views, and he's always eliciting uh, my views, um, wondering you know, what my concerns are, what, you know, how would I take a certain approach on certain issues within, within overall health care. Some of your Republican colleagues say that Barack Obama is a big government Democrat, that he wants to expand the role of government. Some have even used words mm -hmm. like socialist and that sort of thing. Do you see him that way? No, you know, it's interesting I don't. Uh, in fact, um, I've almost sensed the opposite. Uh, he's uh, been very uh, realistic uh, in uh, his views on health care, um, understanding the implications. I, I get a sense that uh, he does uh, study these issues very carefully. He has uh, deep conversations uh, with his staff who advise him on health care. Uh, He's told me on uh, several in several instances where he has actually, you know, been reading the memos, uh, studying the issues, and what's changed in uh, various positions or concepts that you know we had been discussing within our group of six. So he seems to me to be very well informed, well briefed, uh, well versed, um, uh, seriously immersed in the issue, recognizing the implications, and he understands that there are fundamental differences and disparate views and how controversial they could be. Uh, fact is, I've gotten um, an impression that he would you know, probably do less than more. Do you see him as a moderate? More moderate uh, than liberal on this question. He, um, he has advanced the issue of the, of the public option, um, but I, you know, I have sense from the outset that he might uh, be far more flexible on that question. Many months ago when I had an initial discussion with him on health care itself, um, but also in the ensuing conversations, uh, he has seemed to, you know, understand others' views. Um, he obviously puts it forward because that's been his position. Um, but I think he's always indicated a, a willingness to be flexible on this on other issues and taking into account uh, some, you know, differing views on the subject. And he certainly uh, was more than willing to listen to my views and others. Um, and he also. Uh, you know, he, he solicits uh, contrary views and conflicting, you know, positions so that he can better enhance his own uh, approach to it. And I think that that was illustrated in his speech um, of last week before the Congress and to the American people is trying to outline some of the misconceptions and fallacies surrounding uh, a number of issues. And uh, secondly, understanding that there was a lot of confusion that had emerged as a result of the variety of initiatives that had already been considered in various committees in the House or Senate. Now, as you know, Senator Baucus has laid down his bill mm -hmm. after many, many hours of negotiation mm -hmm. with you, other Republicans, other members of the Gang of Six. You've not supported that bill, mm -hmm. uh, but said you wanted to keep working on a bipartisan proposal. Do you think Senator Baucus and his legislation are fundamentally on the right track and it just needs a few improvements to get your support, or do you think he's off in the wrong direction. Well, you know, I, I, I always struggle, you know, with, uh, you know, the magnitude and scope of any um, major initiative uh, because, uh, especially because it represents uh, so much change. So one is, uh, you know, my concern about some of the individual components such as uh, the individual mandate. Um, secondly, the affordability question, and although I know the President has shared that concern as well, I, and a number of my colleagues, both Republicans and Democrats, 
uh, to make sure that we have available to the American people affordable plans. I mean, at the end of the day, that's what they truly expect from any reform of health care. So we, in, we put in an additional $37 billion over those uh, last weeks because I was so concerned about the fact that we couldn't drive down the prices you know, of, a, of the health insurance plans available in the exchange through subsidies and tax credits. Uh, but that, so the individual parts of it that I'm concerned about. Then secondly is the overall approach in making sure uh, that it will be moving in the right direction. We want to build upon what's best about a current system, but we have to change a number of things in order to make it work right for the future given the escalating costs and, and rising at two or three times the rate of inflation. So it's looking at the overall picture as well as the individual parts that make up the whole. But does that, uh, I'm trying to understand whether or not you think uh, with a few amendments in committee that that bill will be good enough for you or do you want, are you more inclined to say start over? No, I wouldn't say, you know, that necessarily you have to start over because there's some very important pieces. I mean, setting up the exchange, uh, creating competition is going to drive the marketplace to drive, to, uh, I think, to achieve lower prices. Even the Congressional Budget Office has estimated they could be a 10 percent reduction in administrative costs uh, through the efficiencies of the marketplace and, com and price shopping that will be available to consumers. Also, removing many egregious practices on the part of the insurance companies uh, in rescinding policies, uh, you know, not allowing guaranteed issue unless the state has obviously made that change, uh, so that people are denied health care, uh, health insurance because of their previous uh, existing condition or because of the health status or because of gender and so on. Uh, so we, we certainly address all of those key issues, uh, restructuring the small business market, individual markets, tax credits, subsidies, all moving, I think, in, in the right direction. The question is the extent to which, uh, you know, we're going to require the American people to comply, you know, with uh, uh, signing up for a health insurance plan and those penalties that are associated with it. Uh, central to that requirement would be affordability. Well, does that mean that you think the bill should have a greater level of subsidies for people, including the 125,000 people in Maine who don't have health insurance? Right. And if so, how would you pay for them? That's right, and that's, that's the question. Uh, and we have increased the amount of subsidies uh, in the legislation. I mean, the, you know, the, uh, the majority uh, you know, of the provisions of the expenditures in the, the plan are obviously uh, the ones that are providing for tax credits and subsidies to individuals who receive their plans in the exchange. And you want more of those subsidies? Yeah, there would have to be more subsidies in driving down the prices. I mean, I, I think competition will certainly do that in many ways. Uh, in fact, even large companies have in expressed a desire to be able to, you know, buy plans in the exchange, even if they're not subsidized. But I mean, people will be able to go price shopping even if they aren't eligible for a subsidy or tax credit. But because of the, uh, the power of the market, this is going to drive down those prices. They'll be more transparent. So that'll be important. But the question is, how, how much subsidies can we afford to provide to middle-income America? And that's the key. Now, whether or not you have an individual mandate or you change it or you tie the subsidies to a lesser plan uh, in the exchange, right now it's tied to, it's tied to uh, the second uh, best, you know, uh, the second plan. In so, the in other words, one way to afford mm -hmm. more subsidies is to ratchet down the level of plan that you're requiring people to have. That's right. Well, the, yes, there are four different plans in, in the exchange. You have the bronze that would be available as well to the young adults, and then you'd have a bronze plan, which is the lower cost plan. Then it's the next is silver, which is the one which the subsidies would be tied to, which is, you know, a good plan. It's a generous plan. Uh, maybe we could give people more choices in terms of their options. But the second part of it is uh, the level of the penalty that's involved with the individual mandate. Um, I have some uh, you know, deep reservations about requiring people to pay a heavy penalty during this economic climate. And uh, you know, I've uh, indicated that to Chairman Baucus as well. And I know he has said that he's going to you know, reduce that penalty, but I'm not so sure you know, how far he's going to reduce it and whether or not that that's still going to be sufficient. I'm guessing you could find some Democrats to agree with you 
on the need for more subsidies and perhaps lesser penalties. Are you optimistic that you can work that out with others on the committee? I do. In fact, some will even will go further and want to drive down, you know, the you know, that your premiums can be no more than, you know, six and a half percent of your premiums. It's interesting, under the bill it's thirteen percent. To go from thirteen to ten would be another thirty billion. To go uh, to reduce it to six and a half percent could be as high as 150 billion. So uh, you can see that there, are, you know, substantial cost involved in whichever direction. But I is think is ten good enough for you? No, uh, no, I'd like to even I would like to go lower. But again, as to how do we pay for it and have to work through that issue? Or the other issue is what you do on the individual mandate, frankly. Uh, because I think and that's are you talking there about in. getting rid of the mandate or just reducing I'm, the penalty? I'm, you know, I'm, I'm uh, sorting through that uh, as we speak. Uh, you know, I'm, I'm still considering uh, whether or not this is appropriate at this moment in time. There, obviously, there are you know some strong reasoning and rationale as to, to why get everyone you know, in the system, to get, especially the young people. Uh, you know, if you get you want to try to capture the 10 million uninsured that are in that category. Um, absolutely, it, it is important so that others don't pay for those costs if, if they you know, end up having a major illness or an accident that, you know, represents catastrophic coverage and, and costs. But on the other hand, uh, we want to make sure that the penalty isn't so great uh, that it really affects people and they end up with no health care coverage. I mean, the point is, if you're going to pay a penalty, I'd like to pay it towards coverage re as opposed to just as simple, you know, as a uh, penalty. Given the fact that the CBO has said that Senator Baucus's bill would, in fact, save money over a 10-year window, are you satisfied that the cost control, cost containment in the bill is adequate? I, I do, and I, you know, we had that discussion this morning with the Congressional uh, Budget Office Director, Doug Elmendorf, with whom we worked hand in glove in our group of six. I mean, we were adamant um, in our, you know, our positions and views that it should be budget neutral and if anything should bend the cost curve and bend the overall cost of you know, the escalation. You know of inflation within healthcare, and it does begin that trend in the first 10 years. He indicated that he could be less certain about the second 10-year window because you know the, the, you can only define it in broad terms is probably going to bring down the cost of healthcare, but obviously it's going to be done with less certainty and predictability because it's so far out. But the point is, it is budget neutral. It does reduce the deficit. That is an important direction, and we were all um, you know insistent upon that. And so I think that that is a very positive aspect uh, to this plan because it is critically important. And frankly, I know some of my colleagues have indicated, well, you know, we could, you know, Congress could change these provisions in the future and therefore as to the cost of the bill, it, you know, takes away the budget neutrality. On the other hand, we could have a requirement to insist that any changes in this particular plan will have to be paid for and fully offset so we always maintain uh, it's budget neutrality as and continue right on now. that trend. That's correct. Uh, you're identified mm -hmm. as a supporter, somebody who offered the idea uh, in discussion of the so-called triggered public mm -hmm. option. Um, are you going to offer that as amendment in committee? And if you get that, it, it's clear to me the White House would accept a, uh, a triggered public option. Mm -hmm. If you get that amendment, uh, are you likely to support the bill? Would that be important? Well, the, uh, I offered the trigger um, you know, many months ago as, as an, al an idea, an alternative to the public option, and I mentioned that to the president at that time. Um, you know, he didn't uh, reject it. In, in, in the ensuing conversations I've had with him and others, uh, they indicated there would be flexibility in that, on, on that point. I think now it's a question as to whether or not you know, we, you know, at which point to address that issue, and I think we'll have to determine whether or not it's on the committee or on the floor, and uh, and how we build a consensus at that point in addition to the other issues. Sounds but like that's it's more likely you would offer that on the floor than in committee. It, it could be. Yeah. I, mean, I have to get a sense of it. I mean, there are going to be a number of amendments in the committee markup, and obviously it's going to evolve uh, depending on, you know, what where the support is and whether or not it's better to... I d offer it on the floor uh, uh, to a broader group than in the committee itself. Senator Baucus and the President and other Democrats uh, who are trying to make this happen have made appeals to, to the sense of history that after so many decades of failing to pass comprehensive reform, this is the time to do it. Do you have a similar feeling? Well, I think um, the time has come, but it's also critical to affect uh, the right policy because it, effect, it affects every uh, American and how we craft that policy will have 
you know, a tremendous impact um, on the country and on something that is so fundamentally important to the American people. So it's important to get it right. And so I have argued from the outset that let's not be bound by artificial timetables and arbitrary deadlines in, in order to get it done. Let's develop a comfort level within, you know, within the Senate, within the Congress, that ultimately will engender the confidence of the American people in the kind of product that we ultimately draft. So I think from that standpoint, it was important. I think that the time has come in terms of the cost, that whether you have health insurance, um, your, your health insurance is in jeopardy because of the rising costs, and for those who don't, who obviously are going to find that it's more and more out of reach and very difficult to ever obtain. You have a, uh, a good sense of the rhythms of this place having yes. served for a while. Does it feel to you that given the level of uh, interaction that you're having with the White House, with Senator Baucus and others, that you're going to end up supporting a package this year? Well, uh, it, it, again, it depends on what we do in the committee. I, I would like to, you know, uh, support a bipartisan consensus-based package on the right policy. And at the end of the day, what is absolutely essential and imperative uh, is to construct the right policy that the American people have confidence in at a time in which they lack the confidence in their major institutions and elected officials. So it's critically important that we do everything that we can uh, to draft the very best approach uh, to overhauling our health care system. And that means taking the time to get it done. Not saying, well, it has to be done in a week or two weeks. So I want to give it my level best as I have up to this point. I want to continue that process. You have to continue to hear, you know, uh, differing views and approaches and see if we can work through and sort through the process. I think that's the ebb and flow of the legislative process. But it's, are you optimistic that that's going to end I think with legislation? I, well, it's, you know, it's hard to tell. Uh, yes, I'm probably more optimistic than less. Uh, but I think it all, I think we'll get a better sense, uh, you know, next week in the Senate Finance Committee. Uh, I think people really want to get something done. They understand uh, the imperative and the urgency of doing something because of the rising cost. I mean, it's really taking it without, out, out of our hands in the final analysis. So we have an obligation to do what's right in addressing a serious problem that's uh, so critical and so fundamental to every American and that's currently eroding the, their health care and will continue to erode their health care in the future, whether you have health insurance or not. And so I think it is important that we do everything we can to get it right. So I'm going to work towards that end to build the bipartisan bridge to get there if, if it's at all possible. If a bill is a whole bunch of Democrats and one Republican, <laughs> well, Olympia Snow, could I that think be that, a bipartisan you know, bill? You know, that's well, uh, obviously I'm a Republican, but you know, I'd like to have more Republicans uh, You'd like on to, board. but do you have to? Well, no, I'm going, to, I'm going to support the right policy. I think that's what guides me and governs me. It always has. Um, and I think the right policy will garner the votes. So do you think mm -hmm. if you had a bill that came up for a cloture vote mm -hmm. to get past a filibuster, and it was 59 Democrats and they needed your vote, and you mm -hmm. liked the bill, could you vote for that well, bill? Well, I'm not going to answer any hypotheticals. That was always very dangerous territory, as I've said. I, I will, you know, vote for the right policy. Uh, that's, uh, you know, w what I've always done. That has been my guiding light frankly, is to discern what is the best approach to any given issue, and certainly it's something as critical as this to, to the country. And so I just hope that everybody will work together because, you know, in the final analysis, it's, it's not only Olympia Snow's responsibility, it's the responsibility of every member of the United States Senate to, to build those bipartisan bridges in the consensus so essential just, to making it happen for the, for, for the country. We've gotten too much into leapfrogging to 60 votes and cloatures and the one vote instead of the policy. Just one question uh, before I let you go on partisanship. Yes. As you know, we've had a uh, fairly substantial realignment in the country where uh, so many Democrats in the South became Republicans mm -hmm. and so many Republicans mm -hmm. in the Northeast have become Democrats. I'd just like to ask you, why are you a Republican? And how mm -hmm. important is your Republican identity to you as a legislator? Well, you know, it's, I've always been a Republican uh, for um, the traditional principles that have been associated with the Republican Party since I, you know, became 
a Republican uh, when I registered to vote. And that is uh, lim you know, limited government, individual opportunity, fiscal responsibility, and a strong national defense. Uh, so I think that those principles have always been a part of the Republican Party heritage. And I believe that I you know, reflect those views. And I haven't changed as a Republican. I think more that my party has changed. Are you getting a lot of heat? pressure from fellow Republicans? No. I mean, I, th I think understandably uh, they overall concerned about, uh, you know, what kind of health care policy will emerge. And so, therefore, you know, looking at the issue, you know, I, I sense among my Republicans, uh, colleagues here in the Senate, that they understand that, you know, this issue needs to be addressed and how best to address it. So they're, they're searching you know, for solutions or what, you know, what they can do to improve upon what is going to be before us in, in the Senate. And so they understand that. And so I don't think it's just necessarily being opposed, but they'll come up with an approach. Hopefully they should. I think Republicans should stand for something on this issue because um, it's, it's so important to the American people. And just because it's difficult doesn't mean that we shouldn't assume the responsibility of addressing it. Senator, thanks so much for joining us. Thank you.